My name is Tawny. Thank you very much for the introduction. Sorry we're starting late. We were just kind of uh, having some AV or some technical challenges. Today, when this idea was born for the conference, it was, um, you know, this conference has um, uh, the, the, the topics and the sessions and the tracks that are part of this uh, conference are things that we're, we're uh, struggling with, challenged with, opportunities and challenges, and of course one of those was, uh, a big one, is housing. I, does anybody di disagree housing is a problem for people with pets? Is that, well of course you don't, that's why you're here. A, that's a silly question. Uh, but one of the things I believe strongly that if I had a magic wand and there's um, two things I could change in Austin. One, if I could uh, move the needle on reclamation because dogs are coming into us and cats, uh, healthy. Somebody loved them. Somebody's got to be missing them. Somebody was feeding them. They're not, their ribs aren't sticking out. They don't have wounds. And so we want to increase our reclamation. But the other thing that I feel really passionate about and why I was excited to be able to spend some time with you and my friends today um, is housing. I believe firmly that if we could change the uh, arbitrary restrictions on pets, people with pets, uh, that we would have empty kennels in most of our communities. And I think one, one of the things that was driving this panel and this discussion is that it's very much for me tied to social justice and who's at the end of the leash, either before the pet came into the system or who wants to have the pet. You know, people that are socioeconomically challenged, that have very little options on where they can live, um, are discriminated against, in my opinion, in, an ex in, a, in a disproportionate uh, amount uh, because they may have like two places they can live. Maybe they're taking the bus to work. Maybe they have to live near work. Maybe they can only afford, there's one choice in that town and there's breed restrictions. And so um, one thing, we'll get into the discussion. My, my colleagues have a lot of good information to share and we wanna take questions because this is, a, this is a dynamic dynamic process of sharing information and talking about opportunities. But um, I talked at a, a long time with the executive director of Animal Farm Foundation last week and she believes and I believe that for us to move the needle on um, housing issues is we need to start stop talking about pets start talking about people because it's a people issue and it's a it's a it's a it's a it's it's poverty issue it's it's a diversity issue it's people are being discriminated against and they can't have their pet they have to give up their pet when they move they can't have the pet they want imagine if you, shelters rescues if people could actually take that pet home but you, how many times do we hear i'd love to adopt that dog but my landlord and so now we're delving into the, um, the subject more and we're finding, what we're finding, and I'm, I'm talking about what uh, Stacy Coleman and Animal Farm Foundation has done to, an, to do research on this subject matter, there's not a lot of um, facts to support this notion that landlords are liable. So they have to put perceived breed in. Now they're doing size, nothing under, nothing over 25 pounds. And so there's, and landlords are saying, well, it's the insurance company. And then the insurance company is saying, well, they're tight with their data because they're using uh, fear to, to drive rates up. And they won't give data out. And, but what, what Stacy and Animal Farm Foundation has done is they, they've done some research that shows that there is, there's not this, they, they couldn't, correct me if I'm wrong, they couldn't find any cases out there where a, la a landlord was liable for what a tenant's dog did. And they found people settling, but settling out of court, that doesn't mean, that's not an admission of guilt. That just means it's cheaper. Why, why go to court over it when you can settle it and it's cheap and usually people just want something paid and they'll go away. That doesn't mean that, that, that anything's happened. So, so it's kind of a tough nut, but I think that we'll probably get traction on this um, a quick, in a quicker way if we are focused on uh, people with pets instead of always talking about pets. Because we keep making it an animal issue, issue and people can marginalize it. But when it's a people issue, and there's one other thing I wanted to say, and Scott, you ha have something with this on public housing. The thing that's really grinding my gears right now is many communities are paying for this, let's call it a problem. Pets don't belong in shelters. Pets belong in homes. That's why it's a problem. 
in my book, that what's driving this, we're paying for it twice. Cities are subsidizing public housing and giving developers tax breaks. Sometimes you're just giving them land. Happened in Austin, the old airport. We're giving land away, we're subsidizing public, subsidizing public housing, we're incentivizing developers to build in our communities. People are making millions of dollars and then they come out with breed restrictions. Some of it doesn't even make any sense. It's not, we know breed is not uh, indicative of behavior. And then we pay for it a second time because we have to take care of the pets that they have to surrender or that they can't adopt. So it's really bad business in my book when we're looking at you know, municipal governance. So that's, so that's, and I wanted to stand because I, also, I sat for the past hour and uh, it felt good to stand up for a few minutes. Um, but that's, that's what we were here to talk about today, and we're hoping, I'm going to turn the mic over to my, to my colleagues to share their experiences, but I think that this, this is a, a, a big barrier for us right now in animal welfare. I do believe we'd have empty kennels and cages if people weren't restricted. Those of you who were in um, the workshop I did a few minutes ago will recognize the trend here of how I managed to um, make good friends in the city government. Um, so in 2008, um, the Washington Humane Society, that was our name at the time, um, working with animal control, um, I noticed one day one of, a couple of the officers came back from the road and they had uh, 32 cats with them that they had picked up during the day. And I just thought that was an insane number. And I said to them, I said to the sergeant, I said, Sarge, Sarge, where did all these cats come from? And he said, oh, housing police did a sweep. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, once or twice a year, without any type of um, uh, uh, warning, they go to the development and they go through every apartment to make sure that they don't have pets. And if they have pets, um, we are forced to take them. I was... Once I was able to speak, um, I was mortified at that, and I um, started realizing the, the problem that DC Housing Authority had with pets. Uh, so I called up the, um, the head of the housing uh, police who was doing this, and uh, you know, one chief to another chief, and I, I, I found, you know, I asked him what was going on, and he told me that you know, we do this so to enforce the no pet policy. I said, okay, well, you know, my officers didn't get a copy of your warrant to remove any of them. Um, I trust you wouldn't remove someone's property without a search warrant. What, what, uh, uh, um, um, you know, we really don't need a, a search warrant. I said, well, okay, so you have consent to take them because my officers don't have any paperwork saying that they authorize removal of the animal. Well, uh, uh, well they don't have a choice because they can get evicted if they have pets. I said, well, that's not really our problem. Um, if they are in violation of a pet policy. And by the way, what is the pet policy? Oh, there's no pet policy. There's no, no pets allowed in D.C. Housing Authority whatsoever. It's like, huh, okay. Well, you should know right now that we will never, ever do this again. So you can stop doing these because we're not going to be there to remove the animals. That will never happen again. And I need to look further into this. And those of you who um, may be aware, there's a federal law, uh, and uh, federal housing, you know, any, anyone who's accepting money from HUD, anyone elderly or disabled, they have to be allowed to have pets. And DC Housing Authority had been um, violating this law for decades and violating people's constitutional rights by just entering their apartment and removing animals. Uh, so I, I teamed up with a good friend of mine over at the uh, American SPCA, the ASPCA, and we set the task to see what we could do about this because they were violating federal law. And we started off, well, we wrote them a letter saying, hey, we realize that you, we recognize you're in federal violation. Um, we're willing to work with you to implement a responsible pet policy. Um, after we had to send that same letter a couple of times, uh, we finally got a response saying, yeah, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about it. Send us your thoughts. So we sent them a model pet policy, and we never heard back from them. Uh, and then finally, we got to the executive director of, the, of the, the, the department who said, 
well, there, we, there's loopholes, and we don't have to allow pets. We don't have to allow pets of any kind. So we, knowing that that wasn't right, we, wrote, we, we started trying to get HUD involved, um, the U.S. Federal Housing Urban Development. We started to get them involved, and they were not you know, jumping up and down to help us with this. So we decided that our only option would then be um, litigation. And we started talking to some of the residents. We tried to find some, uh, some people that had been uh, adversely affected by this policy, whether it be uh, for um, uh, dis disabilities, or not, not being allowed to have a pet. So we started putting a group of people together. We got some lawyers together, some pro bono lawyers. And the, um, the media found out about it and did a story on it. And the local uh, Washington City paper did a story on it. And the next thing you know, HUD sends a letter to uh, DC Housing Authority saying after careful review, you are in violation. You have 60 days to change this. And we went out and we celebrated. We had a great, you know, we thought that this was it. And we met with HUD, we had some meetings with, um, with DC Housing Authority and we agreed to work with them. We, we helped them with a policy. Um, we said, you, you will get 100,000% support and assistance from us. We have a couple of conditions. One, you cannot restrict based on breed. And two, you cannot restrict on weight. Because that was really common in a lot of places. Dogs over 30 pounds or whatever are, are, are not allowed. And they agreed to that. So we had planned and set up um, what we referred to as pet appreciation days where we were going to go into the place where the, the, the housing, de the, the development, and um, current pets would be grandfathered in. We would offer free sterilizations, free vaccines. Uh, we would offer monthly workshops on behavior, health. I mean, we were really going to do this up. Uh, again, uh, I'm a big advocate of community involvement, especially uh, communities that might be more at risk, so I took a special interest in this. Uh, everything was going great until we saw their modified draft that they were about to uh, introduce, and the restriction was no dog can exceed 12 inches from shoulder to floor. So they, uh, they kept their part of the bargain. They didn't restrict on breed or weight, and they put a size restriction on it. Um, so we immediately withdrew our support and went back to them and said, this can't happen. This can't happen. We need to go back to the table. Um, and they said, no, this is what we are going to uh, implement. So we are now working with the DC City Council to legislate. Uh, we're going to get them to mandate a responsible pet policy uh, in the city. We're not there yet, but we have some, some key support within city council. Uh, especially the the, com the the committee on uh, on housing, uh, the chairman there is very into it, and we're uh, we're optimistic. But it just goes to show. Now, again, this has been going on for the past several years, and we refused to give up. We would not take no for an answer. We would not just let it go to the wayside, like a lot of things too often do. And when they and and they kept fighting us, and they kept. You know, they thought they finally had us with this whole height thing, and we're not going away. And if you can take anything from the comments that I have, that should be it. Don't ever give up. Don't ever lessen your standards. Just go head first, kicking down doors and taking names. I almost, I know we're being taped. I almost said a different word, but um, <laughs> kick butt. Um, and and um, it can be done. You just have to keep fighting. Thank you, Scott. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm Lindsay with Lovable. Um, first, I want to kind of see who's in our audience. Um, anyone, like, I guess, uh, shelter? Works at a shelter? Awesome. Um, and then what about legal? Anyone in legal? Lawyers? All right, cool. We need y'all. Um, and then uh, who am I missing? Um, yeah, we got shelters. Uh, well, rescues, sorry, rescues and shelters. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'm so glad y'all are here today. Um, this is um, definitely a topic that um, Lovable um, really, really backs and tries to um, educate and get the word out about 
Um, so one of the things that I wanted to speak about is um, the tools that you can use in your community. Um, for Before I forget, I did place a lot of um, brochures and, and things out on the table. So before you leave, please feel free to, to grab some of that. Um, yes, I, I will say our lovable mission statement is dedicated to promoting responsible uh, guardianship and improving the image and lives of pit bull type dogs through community support, education, advocacy, and rescue. Um, so we we do a lot of community outreach and 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 um, but the big piece of it is that advocacy and um, you know supporting our our local legislation that um, you know gets dogs off chains and um, those types of things, but especially um, BSL with with housing. Um, so. Some of the things that, um, as you probably know, is that BSL, um, which can be a ban or a restriction, um, has taken place in states nationally, and there are no scientific research or evidence that shows that any of that works. None. Um, and what even happens is once that ban is in place, all the research that they try to put together still, again, it comes up with nothing or they do it um, very deceivingly and kind of create their own um, numbers, if you will. Um, so I just wanted to read something. Um, in Aurora, Colorado, um, Aurora passed a breed ban on pit bulls and seven rare breeds um, in was effective in 2006. The most recent statistics from Aurora demonstrate that the annual total of dog bites, including severe dog bites, has not decreased. The bites are primarily inflicted by non-banned breeds and types of dogs. Statistics also indicate that sev uh, severe bites have not deceased, and non-banned breeds of dogs have become been the overwhelming have been overwhelmingly responsible for those in putting lie to the oft-repeated claim that banning pit bulls reduces severe bites. And there's all kinds of information like that that you can find online that I encourage you to print out and, um, and you know, speak to your local, local representatives and, and council to um, really put something in place to get rid of all the breed restrictions and things like that in your community. Um, so some of the things that you'll find on our website is a complete list of housing. Um, if you don't have that on your specific website, I really, really encourage um, at least put a link um, to, if you're in Austin, put a link to Lovable, if you will. Um, if you're not in Austin, um, I really encourage you to create your own link. Um, that way, when people are going and trying to search for homes that um, are apartment complexes and need to find a place to live with their um, pit bull, um, they'll be able to find that information. Um, instead of, you know, immediately just having to come to the shelter and, and drop their dog off. So I really, that's one of the biggest tools, I think, um, to use until we can get rid of the restrictions. Um, let's see, there's also a lot of information online that you can find as far as tips with landlords and property. So if you have someone coming to you that says, hey, I've got to get rid of my dog, I have no other option, um, Maybe if they do have um, a minute of time to um, to kind of, you know, instead of having to give their dog right up, if they do have a minute of time, tell them to put together um, lots of information about their specific dog. Um, or if they're going to go, if they find some new housing that allows pit bulls, tell them to create a resume for their dog. Um, a lot of times, um, once that landlord or department complex management Sometimes when they see that information, um, they really kind of, uh, they might open their doors and they might not, but there's a lot of um, different tools that they can use. Um, so you can also share details of any formal training your dog has had, highlight any special um, recognitions. Um, you can brag about their clean, your clean rental record, um, stress your habits of responsible ownership, um, educate the landlord on the actual risk factors of pets that could cause property damage. Um, I know kids cause more damage than dogs, really. Um, they can ride on walls with Sharpies. Um, pit bulls might be able to pee on your floor or tear up something. But um, So there's um, definitely a lot of information you can find online, and, and I'm happy to, if you contact me, I'm happy to send you all of this information as well. 
Um, Animal Farm Foundation, I think as Tani mentioned, has a lot of, lot of literature. They actually have a website that you can go and print off posters to put into your rescue or shelter. Um, so that's a really good tool that you can use as well. Um, there's also, they have a book, The Pitbull Placebo, um, which I encourage you to read as well. Um, let's see. You know what, and I found, something I found interesting when I went, um, one of the things I was wanting to do is research, how do we persuade landlords um, that it's actually better off for them to rent to people with pets? How do we do that? Um, you know, and it's funny because a lot of the websites I pull up, which, and I was very disappointed at some, um, one of them was the um, Apartment Association of America. Sorry, I have so many pages up here. Um, and I was very disappointed that they quickly jumped at how to um, not allow pets and, and how pit bulls and all the pit bull type bully breeds, if you will, were so bad. Um, in fact, it says, dangerous dogs, what landlords need to know, and it's a dog growling. Um, and that's like the first thing that they're going to go find when they look up that tool. So I think putting a lot more websites and things out there and information for landlords to find is, first of all, very important that we do that. Um, I did find a more positive one. It's called um, Landlordology. <laughs> um, and he actually goes on to stress about how it is important that um, landlords and, and apartment complexes, um, he basically lists out the benefits and the risks, but how they can actually make more money, um, you know, leasing out to individuals with animals. And those individuals with those animals, um, there's some, some statistics that they tend to lease longer and be a longer, um, um, you know, client of, of that landlord. So those are some really good things to kind of go and, and preach about. Um, so some of the benefits was additional income from increased rent or pet fees. Um, you'll get a larger pool of tenants to choose from, an increased tenant enjoyment because of FIDO. Tenants with animals seem to sign longer leases, like I just stated. Um, they can also, landlords can also do things like maybe just require spay and neuter. They can put their, they can put certain things that if they make, it makes them feel more comfortable, um, some of more restrictions, but not as far as breed and size and those kind of things. Um, yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's mainly, those are some of the tools that I really, I wanted to talk about. Um, one, one other thing I wanted to mention too is um, when, I, when I do um, the presentation on breed and language, uh, one thing that we really harp on is uh, our, our the habit we have in shelters and rescues of labeling dogs and guessing on breed. And we feel that's our responsibility, even though we're always wrong. And so by, by insisting on, on labeling that the public wants that, which they don't, they, they, they don't know it. They're not in our shelter every day like us. When they come to adopt, they're not gonna go, where are the labels? They may say, kind of dog is that? Or I'm looking for the lab. And so these are amazing uh, opportunities to find out a little bit about, a little bit more about them and what they're looking for to add to their family. But when we label the cards, not only are they not getting to know the dog and they just, you can see how many of you see them walking down the kennels, just rigging the card and they keep moving, never stopping to get to know the dog. But the worst the worst part of us guessing and labeling on kennel cards is we're doing the discrimination for the landlords ahead of time. We're helping people making millions of dollars. We're guessing, right? We're supposed to guess. The public looks at us as the experts, even though we're wrong. So really we're faking and we're dishonest. We're saying, well, it looks like this, particularly what cracks me up is mixes. I think Kristen and I are presenting on uh, this issue either today or tomorrow, this topic, breed, labeling, and language. And even though we're guessing and we're wrong, we still think we're being transparent and doing the public a service. But one thing we are doing is we're making the landlord's job easier. People know what they're allowed to have or not have in their building. 
And for us to guess is a disservice to the pet. And really, it's a disservice to the people, too. One of the, one of the uh, issues that we deal with very often is we are right on the line with uh, Prince George's County, Maryland. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. Um, they have had a breed ban in place for decades. Um, even when their own uh, city government uh, did a, um, some sort of commission to evaluate the effectiveness of the breed ban, they came back and said, yeah, they say, come back and said, yeah, it doesn't work. Let's repeal it. And the city still hasn't. Um, and, and, and it's been an ongoing problem. One of the things that we do is um, we get a lot of adopters from PG County. And when they come in, if the dog um, fits that bully look um, and the, we're worried about sending them into PG County, is we will send an email to the animal control unit in PG County with a picture of the dog, um, the lab mix or the boxer mix or whatever um, type of dog that they're looking at. We will send a couple of pictures and ask, if, does this qualify for your ban? And then when the officer replies no, um, that you know that dog would be fine in PG, we download that, we print that out and hand it to the owner. Um, because we have had people call saying, hey, PG County's animal control is here, the dog I adopted from you, they're calling a pit bull, can you help? Um, and obviously we do whatever we can. Um, but that's you know one of the one of the tools that we use is we right out of the gate when you when you're saying right out of the gate setting things up we set it up so that the animal control unit if someone comes in two three years from now and says that's a pit bull they have that email with the dog's picture saying no it's been cleared as not uh, a, a pit bull in your in your own you know your own uh, department. 